Hello to this first part of the course of hydraulic groundwater modeling. Um, in this specific video, we talk about the introduction to modeling, say um, to modeling in general, what is a model, and what we expect from a model. I'll go also more specific into prognostic numerical modeling. We will shortly define what that means um, because prognostic numerical modeling is what the content uh, of this course is about. So there is a lot of different kind of models. Uh, I just want to highlight maybe the four most prominent kind of models. Um, and if you look into literature, you will notice that those kind of definitions vary. Um, there is no universal truth. Um, but for the content of this course, uh, those definitions uh, are, are valid um, and they uh, make sure that we all are on the same page and have the same understanding of using different words. Very important um, is the conceptual model. So we will talk about later in this course about uh, workflows and how you start in a conceptual model is always a good starting point, whatever kind of model you're thinking of. Because a conceptual model is a schematic approximation of the system. That means the conceptual model is pen and paper. Um, you draw your region of interest. You think of, okay, what kind of processes are actually going on? What kind of parameters do I need to describe those parameters? How are maybe different processes interacting? How is the geometry? How is my boundary conditions? And all those kind of basic considerations, about like actually what is going on um, in your system. This is what, what you put into a conceptual model. And it really is about the concept. That's where the name comes from um, of what you want to look at. All right. Then, um, well, that's not the part of this course, um, but I, I want to mention it, um, are analog models. So in real science, you often also call them sandbox models because um, they are often done in a sandbox. Um, the idea is here that you reproduce the process you want to study in your system right at a, at a laboratory scale. So maybe you have continental plates and you want to study mountain building then you go to a sandbox, such as maybe a couple days, decimeters or meters long. Um, you put a pour in sand and you do some shearing, some deformation or whatever. This still allows you at least qualitatively to reproduce distant different, different processes. Um, sometimes if you do the scaling correct and so on, also uh, you can estimate things quantitatively. Um, but it doesn't have to be sand. It's just very common in neurosciences that you use sand. Um, but in general, the more, the more general term are analog models. All right. um, analog models could also be used in, in hydrogen sciences, but they are not that common. Then there are purely mathematical models. Um, mathematical model actually already describes it very well what is meant. It means you have a couple of mathematical equations which cover your physics. Um, and you try to solve those um, differential equations usually uh, to, to obtain uh, with some solution um, that describes your process. So um, we will talk about later in this course, giving some ideas about governing equations for groundwater flow. Um, to solve those ones, usually you always per you need boundary conditions from hopefully you know that for, for partial differential equations. Um, and you need some, some initial conditions. So what is, if you have a time evolving problem, uh, you always need to know what is the state at the beginning uh, of my time series. The problem for mathematical models is um, you can set up your governing equations, but actually to solve it, only a very small fraction of problems is actually analytically solvable. Um, and often to obtain those analytical solutions is not trivial for um, less trained uh, people. So a solution strategy for mathematical model is a numerical model, right? But it's separated. A numerical model 
is built on top of a mathematical, mathematical model. Uh, because a numerical model is just a numerical approximation for the solution of the mathematical model. Right? If I can't obtain an analytical solution because my geometry is too complex, my, my domain is heterogeneous, there are a couple of reasons why you might not be able to derive an analytical solution uh, for a mathematical model. Right? Then the numerical model is an approximation. Right? And already I'm here, I want to emphasize the sentence approximation, not the sentence, the word approximation because it means uh, this is not the absolute truth, right? And later in this course, we will talk about accuracy, stability, and other issues with numerical models, right? So you keep already in mind these word approximation. It uh, will become important. So why do we design models? Uh, we design models for a couple of reasons. Uh, we can design models to test a hypothesis. So you believe that the water should flow in a decent way or that you should obtain pressures in a decent way or that you can have a decent pumping rate, for example. Um, all this would be reason to design a model or test if your intuition maybe or your, your interpretation of the field daughter is, is valid. Or that, that's a good reason to design a model. Um, to reduce complexity is also a good reason. It means um, you have this huge bunch of field data, but uh, you might, you know, want to focus on a single point, but you can't do it because of the data uh, amount of data you have, or so on. So you can design, you know, simple models, uh, try to reduce um, the amount of, of information that you have. Models can be used to isolate processes, means um, that's something we, we usually often do in science is there is a lot of couple problems, right? The influence of temperature, influence of, of fluid pressure, or maybe you know you want to include groundwater recharge or not, right? Models is, is very simple for that kind of, of, of idea because you can simply switch on or off different variables um, it's very very easy to to do practically you can also use models to assess quantities which you cannot measure in the field right so for example because well there's just simply no well uh, to, to measure groundwater level or um, you, whatever the, the area is inaccessible for whatever reason right still with a model you can compute what you would expect as a value for example on, on groundwater level at every specific point. And then also very, very common is it to use models for scenario testing and parameter variations. What we mean with scenario testing is that you study different really scenarios, meaning for example, you have a pumping test with different pumping rates um, or different well depth or um, you know different rain events for example so you, you're modifying groundwater recharge and you say well what happens in a dry season what happens if i have a heavy rain event right all those things um, are very good reasons to use models and that's what models are used for very very often and then for parameter variations means that we will talk later about in this course uh, you have field measurements, you have laboratory tests, um, and, and those are not always, you know, giving you the, the, the universal truth. It means there's a variation in, in your data and you only need to use Jewish statistics, or, you know, you get a, you get a range of the value. And so you can see, okay, how does my groundwater flow varies if I assume this value, if I assume this value, or if I assume this value, right? Because we have more than just one hydraulic parameter that is important for groundwater flow. So we have transpassivity, storativity, and whatever goes into those values, means hydraulic connectivity, porosity, and so on. All right. So this is, these are not all cases you can use a model for, but those are good reasons to use a model. And it's also, from my perspective, the most common reasons to apply a numerical model. I already sat on, on the beginning slide that this is not just an introduction to modeling, but to prognostic numerical modeling. So I want to dive now a bit more into what those specifically mean and uh, go a bit more about the relationship about in, in between mathematical and numerical modeling. 
So um, mathematical mod problems or mathematical models um, usually have the problem that it's difficult to derive an analytical solution, right? So an analytical solution really means like I have a partial differential equation and I am able to analytically derive with pen and paper usually um, this function um, of my variable, right? So I can solve the partial differential equation. But this is not possible for all kinds of problems, right? So usually a, a problem or, or a complex geometry um, arises problem. So for 1D, usually um, this is much simpler than I have it for 2D or even 3D uh, problems. And if I have a heterogeneous medium, this also uh, often makes it impossible to derive an analytical solution. Then if I have complex, like time changing initial and boundary conditions, um, this makes it problems so time changing boundary conditions important. Or if I have a very heterogeneous initial conditions, right, all this might make it necessary that I can't derive um, an analytical solution. And then if I'm looking at, at also maybe more complex situations, so not just simple groundwater movement, but for example, salt water intrusion um, into a freshwater aquifer, right? Then, then I have density dependent flow. So the, the whole physical problem um, gets very, very complex. And then I end up with coupled partial differential equations. And sometimes, you know, just my, what I have as a mathematical uh, framework for pen and paper uh, is not, doesn't allow the derivation of an analytical solution, or at least, at least say, um, I need so much mathematical knowledge um, that for us as, as, as geologists or earth scientists, uh, we just simply do not have that mathematical knowledge, right? And also it is kind of time consuming then to, to derive really uh, complex analytical solutions. And this is where you know, the numerical approximation comes in. So the idea is, and we will talk about this in more detail over the course, is that you know we have these continuous world, and we approximate a solution of this continuous world at discrete points in time and space, right? And, and, and in the opposite to the driving analytical solution, there is very little pre-knowledge um, that I need to know before I can apply a numerical model because it's a computer program I'm using, and once I know what are the, how the computer program works, I theoretically can use a numerical model. This course is about to give you more feedback or more knowledge behind the scenes, what's actually going on and what you should consider when you're designing a numerical model. But, you know, from the, the, the handwork, um, the numerical approximation is, is much, usually much simpler than deriving an analytical solution. And it has those benefits that um, as you said before, you can easily switch on and off physical processes. You can do scenario testing. Once you have designed your model, you have you, you defined the geometry, um, you can you know use the same model very, very quickly uh, for a bunch of scenarios and you can even automate those ones. So your, your user input is not uh, necessary. So you, you set up your, your model and you go home and let your computer do the work. And the next morning you're coming back to work and, and, and your results are there. So um, this is all the benefits of, of um, the numerical model. Um, and you know, you can improve your understanding about what's going on in your, in your domain, in your region of interest um, by those models. Because you know, you get in with time, you get an idea, okay, if I, if I change this parameter, this will happen. If I change the parameter in this direction, this will happen. So, you develop a bit of an intuition and this course is also about to um, help you understand or getting a first touch um, of understanding what is what will change if you do several things with your numerical model. So getting a bit more into the concept of a mathematical model, we have a central part those governing equations. Those governing equations are those mathematical equations that describe the processes you want to look at. Right. So for groundwater flow, that would be the equation maybe for horizontal groundwater flow and tracer transport. Right. Those would be your two equations which you need to solve and they describe the physical process you want to look at. How exactly those equations will 
look like. We'll be coming discussing this uh, course later on. If you have those equations, you need to feed them, right? So those equations I just described um, are based on the conservation of mass and they're related with some parameters, for example, which means um, hydraulic conductivity, transmissivity, storativity, things like this, right? Diffusivity for the tracer transport. So I need to feed those to governing equations with parameters. Right? Parameters are usually constants or maybe time and, and, and uh, temperature or pressure dependent, right? There could be dependencies like this, but they are not the go to, to, to solve in my partial differential equations. So those are not the functions I want to solve. It's just functions of parameters going into uh, the governing equations. What I actually need to solve is like my output variables. This is something like um, my hydraulic hat, for example, for groundwater flow, or uh, my tracer concentration. Okay. It might be necessary that to calculate those output variables, I need input variables. This kind of determines the complexity of your model. Um, if you, for example, um, consider what I said before, um, salt water intrusion into a freshwater aquifer, then you know salinity as a concentration would be important because um, this is a variable. It changes every time and, and dependent on the others, but it influences, for example, my density, right? Or you can also consider temperature, like if you're thinking of geothermal springs or geothermal systems, temperature is a crucial uh, parameter. Again, temperature influences uh, hydraulic conductivity, uh, pardon, uh, density. Right, so it would be an input variable for your governing equations to then calculate the hydraulic hat. And then, as I already said on the slide before, to any solve any kind of partial differential equations, you need boundary conditions, right? Um, so boundary conditions really are the values at the physical boundaries of the region of interest, right? In initial conditions, if you have a time evolving problem, so are the conditions at the first time step. And if you have all those informations, you can come up with a solution, right? So then your system is solvable, at least numerically in our approximation, and uh, you can uh, determine this uh, solution. However, if we're talking about, for example, parameterization, um, that we, we can do those in different types, right? And, that what most people think of when we're talking about a numerical model is a deterministic model. That means there is no random variation, everything is well defined, it follows definite laws, and there is a clear cause effect relationship. Right? So the cause effect relationship means if I change this parameter, always this will happen. Right? So there is a clear um, cause effect, cause and effect relationship. Uh, however, they are all different forms. You can also have a stoch stochastic model, which means that variables are following some kind of probability distribution. Right? Um, th that, that can be for different reasons. For example, because physically we don't know the system well enough to describe everything uh, in a deterministic way. That means also is sometimes in Asia there are just stochastic effects. Um, that we can't represent deterministically, and you want to use that one by by applying some kind of, of stochastical law. Um, right? And you can also just relate processes. The example here is discharge and precipitation um, by some correlations that you find statistically. Well, um, and then, of course, there's also a mixed form of both ones where you apply parts of, of, of both ideas. Um, so what, for example, is, is very often done is um, using a stochastic distribution of parameters uh, to, to represent heterogeneity in your domain. So as you said, as you do field measurements and you get maybe some kind of statistics um, and you say, well, OK, so I assume my hydraulic conductivity is this value plus minus 10 percent. Um, and then you do, you know, statistical distribution, maybe applying some, some normal distribution. Um, and you see, okay, getting getting some heterogeneity into your domain to see how much it influences your your results, right? So this is one way uh, to do this. 
very often empirical and stochastic models are a bit mixed up so i want to try to separate it more clearly an empirical model is based on observation and result so it gives me a relationship between two parameters input and output um, but this relationship is not based on a physical law so it is still a mathematical function and it's not statistics so there is no no distribution um, and the, the the relationship is always the same but how I come up with this relationship is not based on, on some physical consideration considerations but simply because I measured uh, input and output and I make a fit uh, I try to find a function that defines my measurement data with the relationship between those parameters in, in the best way possible all right so you have some mathematical functions in this function there are coefficients and you determine those coefficients through calibration right so sat through a fit uh, between both data sets um, and you have th those coefficients that they, they have no usually no physically sound meaning right it's just coefficients um, and then yeah sometimes you can see okay in these kind of catchments for example the the coefficient is small for those kind of catchments the coefficient is large so you can do separations but they have no physical meaning usually usually um, all the uh, empirical models are strictly speaking only valid for the data set that you use for calibration right so um, if you have an insufficient data set your empirical model can be totally totally wrong so as I said here we have a relationship between precipitation and discharge um, and you only do for calibration a data set using data from from summer then you can hardly apply probably this kind of American model to, to a winter period right so I just want, want to highlight the problem here that empirical models are usually a, color, uh, a limited use our case so you always need to check if your application area is suitable for this kind of empirical models or the other way around finding the right empirical model uh, for those kind of um, situation you're testing um, it is though very very helpful to have empirical models at least if you know so less about the process and about relationships I mean, empirical models are very very common if you talk about for example temperature and pressure dependence of density or it's also you can also throw in salinity so having um, influence of those variables on different parameters we often often rely on empirical models but especially then it is important to make sure that for example the temperature range that is governed by this empirical law also matches the temperature range we want to consider in our specific scenario so there is some care uh, when selecting the right empirical model right I also said on the beginning slides um, we want to do prognostic numerical modeling what it actually, actually means prognostic so it's kind of a forward modeling we want to go from a model to data so we want to know okay we have those kinds of parameters those kinds of hydraulic connectivities and these kinds of pressure hats and the boundaries how does the flow looks like within my model within my region of interest um, so more abstractly speaking we have some processes we have the relevant parameters for those processes and then we calculate the variables based on those uh, processes and parameters this is what you might consider well okay yeah that's modeling but there's also another part of modeling it's called inverse modeling and it really is the other way around it means I measure data in the field and I want to derive for example my parameters um, that cause those data this is very very common in geophysics and meteorology so you can have it in, in, in geoelectrics and seismics um, as is, is typical use cases and it's a bit more complex uh, way of thinking because you need to include the forward operator which we have also in prognostic modelings which means it relates your um, model parameter uh, and gener based on this one you generate artificial data which you could have measured and you compare this fictive data so this calculated data with the real data and try in a minimization, minimization process you try to come up with the best set of parameters describing the data set that you obtain in the field uh, 
And um, as you also as you said, it's, it's most common in geophysics and meteorology. There are also applications in hydrogen sciences, uh, for example, for infiltration processes and estimating um, parameters uh, for infiltration models uh, using using inverse techniques. Um, but it's an iterative process. It will not be the content of this course. I just want to know that there is something like this exists um, and that it can be very, very useful depending on what you want to do. And then finally, now we, you notice we're going a bit through vocabulary, which you need to know. Um, transient and stationary models. So this is all about time evolution. If I have a stationary model, um, it's not changing over time. My variable is not time dependent. Um, there are a bunch of words, stationary, steady, steady state, whatever you like it. Um, it just simply means something is not evolving over time. The transient problem on the other, on the other hand is evolving over time. Right, you can call it unsteady, non-stationary, dynamic, bunch of words, bunch of synonyms for the same thing. Um, it simply means the separation between do I ha have something that is evolving over time or do I have something that is not evolving over time. Right? And of course, uh, this kind of influences your your solution strategy for your problem. Right? It often is considered that stationary models are more simple. Um, but that's just rule of thumb, doesn't have to be, uh, depends on a lot of things. Uh, but it definitely changes your, your way of, of how you're tackling the problem. And it's something you should make yourself clear at the beginning before you set up your model. Like, is there a time uh, dependence? Is things changing over time? Or do I just want to have a steady state uh, scenario? And then, of course, there's something that's called quasi transient model, which means you assume your system has long enough time uh, to come up to a steady state, so to, to a steady solution. However, maybe because of changing boundary conditions, um, you have several of those stationary situations one after another. And so there is some kind of time evolution, but every time the solution itself is stationary. And that's what you call a quasi-transient model, which is not that common maybe in, in hydrogeology or groundwater modeling. And then um, once you have a model, um, you need to verify it and you need to validate it. Again, those two words in literature often get mixed up, um, might be used as a synonym, uh, whatever. Here in this course, I'm following that definition um, so that we, everyone knows what is meant if I use different terms. Um, so for the verification, I mean the process that you confirm that your model is correct all right so if you buy some kind of commercial software let's say fee flow or uh, any other kind of, of common model you kind of assume that the developers have verified the model right you can do this by, by comparing it to an analytical solution or to a huge data set of, of, of uh, well well-defined information uh, well, well high, high data quality Everything uh, parameters well defined. You can compare it also to, to laboratory experiments, so quantitative um, laboratory experiments. But this is pretty much that you don't have any, any bugs. There is no, you know, no stupid things happening like forgetting forgetting a minus sign somewhere or something like this, right? This is a lot about code development, right? So if the software is released also from huge open source packages, you can assume okay that that should be verified, right? Um, on the other hand, the validation is something that you need to do every time you set up a model. Right? What you do with the validation is um, that you make sure that your model itself, so the boundary conditions, the parameterization, all this is done correctly. Right? You can do this by, for example, comparing it to, to, to pumping test data, to well test data. Uh, it, it, it's a check for consistency um, of your model. And that is, you know, that you, the model model is for whatever you want to use, um, you know, is, is, is sufficient enough to, to give you the results you want to do. And this is something you may much need to make sure um, every time you design a model. And this is uh, just having a quality check here that the model is verified and that it's validated. Um, and this is, for example, where I want to warn you if you go for 
you know, on the internet for some simple uh, software that, that, you know, someone has designed as their master thesis or whatever, um, they, they, they might go, you know, a bit easy on, on verification validation uh, because, you know, it's, it's mainly time consuming and you're not gaining usually much out of it, but it is an important, important quality check. Right? And, and a good software always has the verification, automatic testing procedures. Um, so this is, yeah, it's a check of quality. And for the validation, um, this is what you need to do uh, to be sure of your own, um, yeah, quality of your model. So what I want you to, to get from this uh, lesson is the different kind of models. And I, I highly encourage you to learn the different terms, uh, to know by heart what it means if you use different keywords that were introduced in this lecture. It's not just important for the for the course of uh, well of, of this course, um, but also you know when you have when you're talking with other papers or you're reading reports about models. Um, those words will come up and you need to know what is meant by it and uh, what people have intention if they use different kinds of words. So please, please, please uh, learn the vocabulary. It will be used throughout the course continuously um, and it will, you know, benefit your future uh, if you know how those, uh, what, what is meant by those uh, words. Thank you very much.